platform. I don't remember exactly where I got those. Um, so the questions were, um, What is the origin of maybe I should What's the origin of inertia? Um, what's the ontological status of space and time? I think we can just find them on this panel and then look at the map. By the way, once again, I'm going to uh, end exactly on time and have somewhere I have to be. If it's conceivable, any one of you might wish to be there too, because it's a, uh, there's a kind of philosophy of physics talk going on. And, and about, I have to admit, it's kind of an abstruse topic from my point of view. Uh, so I'm not 100% I'm sure I'm going to understand it. <laughs> Metaphysics and modality in the philosophy of physics. That may not even mean anything to you. Modality? But it means basically terms involving, questions involving necessity and possibility. And what those have to do with uh, a weird interpretation of quantum mechanics, which I'm going to talk about later, called the many worlds of interpretation. But I'm going back up to Stevenson Hall in hopes of finding out what that's all about. And you're all welcome to come if you're interested in that. Because it sounds like a topic that you could get interested in. Where is it in any book? Stevenson Hall, 1145, at least, seminar room. go back to, um, so it, where I left off, I don't remember, so does anybody remember exactly where I left off? Because I was, I was just trying to finish off with the, the metaphysics and epistemology of general relativity, right? So I was talking about the fact, I think this might be where I left off, that Einstein's view was, of general covariance, was that if you have, um, Prime colliders, is in the sense of you have a mesh drawing, you have, say, rulers that are measuring other objects, right? You know that things are congruent to one another. Any measurement you make is just determined by your observation of how the points line up. So if you took this same drawing and sort of stretched it out, right? But you sort of stretched everything so that nothing actually broke and you left the thing, the same things touching the same other things, it would almost be like looking at the reflection of you know, whatever you've got in some kind of funhouse mirror. Right? But Einstein says, well, because this is the objective knowledge that you have is just the knowledge of these coincidences, well then, it stays the same, whether you're looking at this picture of it or the kind of stretched out picture of it that left the same things touching the same thing. Now, Poincaré had a discussion of this already. He was the first person really to think about these things. I think well before Einstein came around to thinking this way. <coughs> um, he had this thing that he called intuitive geometry. I shouldn't say he had a thing. He, he 
described a certain kind of geometry as intuitive geometry, in which he said, um, it's kind of like the way a child draws, right? That if the right things intersect with the right things, and there's the right number of, say, edges and vertices, then you've got all the information that a child's drawing contains. Right? If you go, you know, if you look at childish drawings of, I mean, suppose I carefully drafted a picture of uh, a house with a certain geometrical shape, right? Um, and I carefully measured out these windows, right? Well, you've seen, or maybe you've done these yourself when you were, you know, maybe you're like me and you still draw this way. But, you know, child, childish pictures of houses allow you to sort of stretch out all these things any way you like, right? I mean, that's, you know, does this look unfamiliar to you? Or do you that's how, that's how a lot of kids actually do draw this. You know, they feel like, yes, I've rendered a house where it has square windows and rectangular door and a triangular top. What do the two have in common? Well, everything that's an intersection here is an intersection here, and everything that's an edge has a corresponding edge here, and everything that's a vertex has a corresponding vertex there. Right? So in, in that sense, these two things are equivalent. And this is exactly, in a way, what's captured was supposed to be captured by Einstein's claim, well, anything that's a real verification of a measurement in physics is a verification that measuring instruments are touching each other. Right? The coincidence, I had this quote up before, uh, the coincidence of the points of measuring instruments with other material points is what's the objective basis for space-time judgment. And you can leave those untouched by stretching out everything else. And I think, they, I remember if I got to this at the end of class, or just talking about this at the end of class last time. Um, but there's something really bizarre about this view, and I think Poincaré would have said this too. I mean, it's already there in Poincaré's discussion of subjective versus subjective simultaneity, right? The, sub, the psychological versus subjective time, right? Because if you ask, it's one thing to say, this is all I really observe. It's another thing to say that's an objective basis. Right? I think I was saying this at the end of class. It takes some kind of, Poincaré would have said, some conventions have to be established before you even know which material points are touching which other points. Right? Like if you see uh, a star that is uh, occulted by the moon, it would be very hard to see because the moon might be a little bright. Are they actually touching each other? Or, you know, of course you don't know that just from the appearance of, right? That's it, it, it actually some heavy theoretical knowledge on the basis of conventions about light propagation usually is necessary in order for you to say what in your visual field is touching what. Because there are lots of things that appear to be in contact, right? You see what I mean? Just look, uh, look at me. Like you, can you, you can't really tell from where you're sitting if I'm actually touching this blackboard, right? Or, right. Check. Sure. Good. Um, you, people create optical illusions like this all the time. Uh, right. I mean. 
sort of mildly curious observer of the phenomenon of taking selfies. Uh, it's not something I've ever done because I can't imagine anything less worth having than a picture of myself. <laughs> But you know, you see, if you go to tourist trap places, you see people sort of getting pictures of themselves, pretending to be holding the Eiffel Tower like this, but you know, just because you know, using this perspective trick, right? Because of course, it's only that big. And so, well, what what does that tell you? It tells you because you can play these tricks, you actually need a kind of objective theory about the measurement of distance in order to establish what's really touching what. What are the, the, the point coincidences, in other words, aren't presented to you as objective knowledge. So if you look back through the history of, say, thinking about relativity of motion in space-time, right, um, when people talk about, people say, like, Leibniz and Newton, we didn't really talk about this, but you could say, it's not that hard to understand that you could have a debate between two people who think, you know, well, we've measured, the, we've measured the relative positions of the sun and all the planets. Uh, that's objective, but how are we going to settle whether it's the sun moving around the earth or the earth moving around the sun? And you know, Leibniz and Newton would have agreed, well, the objective facts here are that there are these relative positions. This is, you know, for example, Mach's paper. Mach says, well, here's the, you know, at any given moment, there's the relative positions of these bodies with respect to the fixed stars. Right? But the real theoretical question is, should, do I have any reason to think that the sun is in the center of this? OK, I do. Yes, it's a much simpler model. But the objective fact is just the arrangement of things in, in space. But the arrangement of things in space isn't something that you sort of immediately get. You have to reconstruct that, right? The information that things are in a certain relative position uh, if you think, what does that mean to you? Now, you're an observer standing on the Earth. What are you directly observing about planetary motion? Right? When Leibniz and Newton, or say Mach and Newton, supposedly they had met, are arguing, right? They're more or less thinking of the planets and the sun as almost lying in a plane, right? They have all these relative positions, and then there's the stars around them. And they're thinking, well, you know, Mach is thinking anyway. Uh, the, the fact established by scientific observation is the relative position of the Earth and the Sun and all the other things. But even that, that's not really basic observation. Really basic observation is you're standing on the Earth and you see where these things appear on the celestial sphere. So to get from this picture to this picture where you're saying, well, I can draw a circle, I can draw an ellipse around the sun like this, or I can draw an ellipse around the earth like that. You've already sort of constructed a picture, a geometrical picture, of these objects in space from where they appear on the sphere. And it took a lot of sort of theoretical assumptions, inventions, Poincaré would call them, to go from the, the subjective picture of what you experience to this picture of the fact. And then it would take more theory, of course, to decide, is it really the Earth moving around the sun or the sun moving around the Earth? So Newton would say, well, let's, let's now consider these things not just as geometrical configurations changing through time. Let's think about it as physics. Well, the sun is an incredibly large mass exerting a central force on all the planets. Therefore, the center has got to be really near the sun. There's no way that the Earth's mass is big enough to have the sun revolving around it. Right? But that's even more theory to decide that question. But just to decide the, the simpler question, 
What are the relative motions? Like, you need to sort of theoretically embed, use theoretical principles to embed your experience of how things appear to be related to one another to, to go from that to, to this geometrical picture of their configuration. So when Einstein says, um, well, all we can really observe is the functional incidences, it's true that you could say, yeah, that, that kind of is all I can observe from here. But then I shouldn't think of that as an objective picture. In fact, I can't learn anything about the structure of space-time from the point coincidence that I observe from here. Right? Because as far as I can see, you know, uh, your head is touching the desk, three desks behind you, but right? from my perspective here, if I didn't have a theoretical, a simple theoretical picture. involving really simple principles like light travels in a straight line, or objects don't change their size much when you, they move around in space. Right? Those are simple conventions, but Poincaré would say if you didn't have them, then you wouldn't even have uh, knowledge of how the things are arranged in this room. Um, so where does the objective, where does objective knowledge of space and time come from? Yeah, this is, if you took this point coincidence idea that Einstein suggests, that the really boiled down empirical basis is just these point coincidences, it's not really clear how you answer a question like, you know, whose theory is right, my theory or Newton's? Or let's say, you know, is space time really curved? Well, you could just you could say this, right? Here's a picture. Suppose I just draw this picture on a rubber sheet and say, uh, you know, here's here's the relative configuration of all these things in space. Then I take that same thing, that rubber sheet, and I just kind of radically stretch it out until everything looks you know, completely different. Well, it wasn't curved before, but it is now. You see what I mean? Um, You're asking the question, what's the empirical basis for my knowledge of space-time? From a, a kind of, if you're thinking about it from a purely epistemological point of view, right, then you can see why somebody would say, well, all I can really observe are these coincidences of material things with other material things. And that's the only thing that's objective. But on the other hand, if you're thinking of it from a physical point of view, and you want to ask questions like, well, is space-time curved or not? Is it curved or flat? Well, then it's, then you need to make measurements of something beyond just you know, point coincidences. And you, have, you want to ask a question like, well, just exactly how much was the path of this starlight deflected as it passed by the sun? Much more complex picture. There's one of the um, all this is setting up uh, the viewpoint of uh, Hermann Weyl, as I mentioned before, and contemporary of Einstein's, almost exactly contemporary, I guess, but more of a mathematician than Einstein was, and less of a physicist. He wasn't really known for any original discoveries in physics, but he was um, 
When I was a, when I was a graduate student, somebody gave me that book, his book, The Philosophy of Mathematics and Natural Science. He told me that I should read it because it contains all the world's wisdom. And that actually turns out to be true. If you ever want to know what all the world's wisdom is, you should get Herman Weil's Philosophy of Mathematics and Natural Science. Uh, but there's one there's one chapter from it that I uh, put in Owl to read. And one of the, one of the uh, questions on the assignment is a quote from it, I think. And so the, the chapter that I, could, that I asked you to read, um, it's, a, it's a very different perspective from Einstein's on these basic questions that I was asking before about the interpretation of general relativity. You know, basically, they all, they're all questions of just how radical of a departure uh, from Newtonian physics is general relativity. Because when Einstein, especially when he talks about point coincidence, he said the origin of inertia, it sounds like a really radical departure. Because he's saying, well, you know, this, there's no such thing as the inertia of a single body. Newton's theory would tell you if, if, if there's nothing in the universe but this one particle, it moves uniformly in a straight line. But I'm, according to Einstein, there is no sort of structure built into space time. It's just that this inertia is sort of imposed on this body by distant masses. So, how, of course, how could it have inertia if there are no other distant masses? And so, and, and other questions like, well, Newtonian physics says if you have if something's really rotating, then there are centrifugal forces. And Einstein says, well, there's no such thing as rotating and non-rotating anymore. Right? So, the question is, is it really that radical of a of a departure? Um, well, we saw what the basis of the departure is. The basis of the departure of Einstein's theory from Newton is the idea that. The difference between a, a, an inertial frame and a freely falling frame becomes arbitrary. Right, we talked about that many times, right? The, the equivalence principle. But does the difference between an inertial frame and a rotating frame become completely arbitrary? Well, no, not really, because um, in, you remember I talked about this in special relativity. I said, how do we think about rotation? Well, um, if you take the world lines of all the particles on a disk, right? If the disk is not rotating but moving inertially, then you can always. Uh, all the particles of the disk are inertial trajectories in space-time. You could always find a surface that cuts them all orthogonally. Whereas if they were if they were rotating, then they would have this kind of helix structure. And, and a plane that cut one of them wouldn't cut the one next to it at the same angle. It wouldn't cut them all ending up orthogonally. But this is one of these features of special relativity that's the same in general relativity. Because in general relativity too, of course, you have a metric of space-time. This is what I was talking about last time when I, when I said, if you look uh, at any small area of space-time, right, it's much like looking at uh, a small area of the Earth and saying, well, if I look at this small area, things behave as if there's a Euclidean plane there. Right? If you look at a 
small part of space-time, well, there's locally, there's a kind of, it looks as if Minkowski space-time is a correct model of it. The problem for, that, that teaches you that the Earth is not flat, is that you try to, that you consider the relation between the Euclidean plane on one part of the Earth and the Euclidean plane on, on another part of the Earth, you find that they're relatively disoriented. And it's the same with a curved space-time, right? You find that the relation between the Minkowski structure with its light cones at one part of space-time and the Minkowski structure with its light cones at another part of space-time, you find that they're disoriented relative to one another. Right? So, uh, Because this, locally speaking, it's the same, it's the same space-time structure that you had in special relativity. Then questions like, is this an accelerating frame? That's a question that you have to think. Well, that's that's not really clear because I feel like I'm moving inertially. I'll say you look like you're accelerating, but you'll say the same thing about me. But on the other hand, if you're rotating, then according to the, the local Minkowski and structure of space-time, right, you'll be rotating for sure. And the other frame will also look like it's rotating if it really is, and there will be centrifugal effects. So you don't really get rid of absolute rotation the way one of the main things Einstein wanted to do was to get rid of absolute rotation, but he didn't really succeed in doing it. And uh, another one of the, so that's one thing sort of down the drain. Did, did, did general relativity really generalize relativity? Well, that's kind of the wrong way of putting it. Um, the relation between general relativity and special relativity that makes one general and one special isn't that there's more relativity, so to speak. It's really that uh, special relativity is a special case of general relativity. So it's not so much a difference between absolute and relative as it is a difference between global and local. I'll explain what I mean by that, I hope. So think about it this way. This is connected with the question of the origin of inertia. So suppose you have a bunch of, according to Einstein's theory, let's just put an outline of the theory. This is in the notes, but I'll just put it up here anyway just to refer to it, right? So in the Newton, Newton's theory, you have, um, because you have a uh, flat space-time, we'll call it, this we'll call it Newtonian space-time for the moment, right? So, What's the basic equation for Newtonian gravity? It says, well, the accelerations of falling particles uh, are in some proportion to, right, or an expression of just the distribution of mass. So that's kind of what Newton told you, right? And that's how you solve the problem of how the structure of the solar system, right? Well, all the, it, the, the solar system has the configuration it does because the sun is this huge mass and all the planets are tiny masses. And the sun's huge mass causes this gravitational field all around it. And so you can measure that by you can measure the gravitational field by tossing out a bunch of particles and see how they accelerate, right? Your space-time, what's, what's the limiting behavior, right? The limiting behavior is 
um, as uh, the gravity as the mass goes to zero, right? Acceleration goes to zero. Or you could say, as r goes to infinity, in other words, right, the moon has to accelerate around the Earth, right, because the Earth's mass is exerting a gravitational pull. This is the basic Newtonian idea. Right? If the Earth's mass shrank to zero, then its effect on the moon would shrink to zero, and the moon could be more and more going in a straight line. But by the same token, if you got far enough away from the Earth, right, the, the Earth's effect on the moon would be getting much, much smaller. And in the limit, if, if, if you got infinitely far away from the Earth, then it would behave just like there was no Earth at all. right? So what does Einstein's theory say? What does it mean? Once you realize that you've kind of given a, a replacement for this equation in Einstein's theory, what does that equation say? It says uh, the relative acceleration of geodesics, right? Of the geodesic deviation, right? The way that inertial paths in space time are relatively accelerated. That's the basic feature of general relativity. Right? Well, that's an expression of the space time curvature. That's a measure of the space time curvature. If you want to know how curved is the space time, well, throw out some objects in the gravitational field and see how their inertial trajectories converge and diverge. And that's one way of measuring the, the curvature of space time. Right? And that's an expression of the distribution of mass, except because it's relativity, then you have to say mass and energy. So in Einstein's theory, you say, well, I no longer have an equation that represents absolute acceleration as depending on the gravitational field. It says, well, the relative acceleration of geodesics depends on the local curvature and is a sort of expression of the local curvature, and the curvature is determined by the mass. So the curvature varies through space time depending on how mass is distributed. But then if you look, what's the, what's the sort of uh, asymptotic behavior? By asymptotic, I mean, what's the sort of limiting case behavior? Well, suppose that uh, suppose that the stress, energy, momentum, right, the mass and energy, all the things that determine curvature go to zero, right? Well, then of course the curvature goes to zero. Or if you get infinitely far away from a mass, right, the curvature goes to zero. So stop me if, you, if this doesn't make sense, because it should one of the things you should, uh, it's not your fault if you haven't got it by now, because it's just my responsibility to make it plain if I haven't. So do stop me. I mean, it should make sense to you if you're thinking about, you know, um, you, have a very, you have a very large mass here. And of course it makes Newtonian sense to say there'll be a stronger gravitational field near it. In curved space-time terms, you have a very large mass there, like a solar mass, a stellar mass, right? Uh, though the closer you get to it, the more strong the space-time curvature is. And remember, I talked about this before. You go further away, you go far enough away, the light cones kind of seem normal. 
But the reason why you have black holes is because the space-time structure is being distorted to such an extent that the closer you get, right, the more this, the more the lifetime structure is warped by the presence of this huge source of mass energy. And that's why you can't escape even by traveling at the speed of light from a black hole. Right? So any particle that's too close to this mass will be trapped in some kind of trajectory around it and will spiral into it. Right? Just as, you know, uh, as is demonstrated, you see that according to those eclipse ex observations of 1919, particles of light passing by the sun are curved by the sun. Uh, the, the paths of those particles are curved because the space time in that vicinity is curved. Right? Does that make sense? So it's, it's such a strong analogy between the Newtonian picture of this and the Einsteinian picture. And part of that analogy is, well, if you, if you got really far away, right, then it's, you're gradually moving closer to a world that looks like special relativity. So in a sense, it's like you're saying special relativity isn't wrong in the way that Einstein first thought it must be wrong. It's actually just the way any small part of the universe really does look. It's just that in the large scale, it doesn't quite look that way. Right? Now, but what does this mean about these other questions we were asking? Well, does space-time have any structure that's not kind of imposed from the distribution of masses? Well, obviously, the further away you get, uh, the more you have a kind of flat space-time structure. Space is, when you go to infinity, space goes to being flat. So space-time still has a structure, even though it doesn't have it, even if you're infinitely far away from other bodies. What does that mean? That means that if you got infinitely far away and you had a particle just that you gave a kick, it would just move in a straight line uniformly the way Newton said it would. Now, if that's true, then can you really say as Einstein hoped he would be able to say when he started coming up with general relativity, could you really say that the inertia, that bodies don't really have inertia, that it's not a feature of the space-time itself that they have inertia, it's imposed by the distribution of masses. Well, if I can get far enough away from masses that the world just kind of looks like one, like special relativity anyway, right? then, Have I really explained the origin of inertia? Or is it just that, you know, it's pretty much the same space-time theory I had before, except that it's only locally flat and globally how it, globally it can be curved when you introduce other masses. Does it make sense in this theory to say a body with nothing touch, nothing influencing it could still have inertia just by virtue of following an inertial trajectory in space-time? Well, yes, it does, because if you get far enough away, it just looks like a flat space-time anyway. But this is the view of the, this is the general view of the subject that, that Arthur Eddington and Herman Weil were trying to, to articulate, in spite of the fact uh, that Einstein was still thinking that he had successfully incorporated Mach's principle into it. If he'd gotten rid of, if he'd, if he'd explained why, uh, if he'd ex 
explained the origin of inertia and gotten rid of absolute rotation. If you ask these sort of Newtonian questions, like, if there was only one particle in the universe, what would it do? Or if there was only one body in the universe, could it be rotating? Would it make sense to say that it's rotating? These questions have the same answer in the end in general relativity that they have in the Newtonian mechanics. As you get far enough away, it's kind of like you're in a flat space time anyway. So Lyle and Eddington were, were defending the view that actually general relativity isn't a new kind of metaphysics for space time. It's just a new picture of space time that says something really shocking and radical. I mean, it's a great, it's a beautiful theory, and they, didn't, they were you know, certainly not questioning Einstein's genius or anything like that. But philosophically speaking, they thought the right way to see the theory is that it's more of a, of a continuity in some way with the older theories of space-time. Because it's really the same structure that you have in Minkowski space-time, except that now you're allowing that the distribution of matter affects the structure. So according to Weil, for example, the one thing, this is one of the things that he says in that paper, right? the one thing that Einstein was really right to be bothered by as a real problem with the earlier theories um, is this notion that space-time just sort of sits there and guides matter in its motions, but matter does nothing back, right? It's just sort of that space-time acts on things but is not acted upon. And Weil's view was, well, see, now we see, thanks to Einstein, that it's true that the inertial structure of space-time guides particles in their motions, but it's also true that the mass and energy of particles affect space-time too. Right? So this picture says space-time is flat and gravitational fields change the motions, alter the accelerated motions of particles. This point of view Empirically says the same thing, but metaphysically, you might say, says, well, the structure of space-time and the distribution of matter are coupled to one another. They interact with one another. You change the structure of space-time when you change the distribution of matter. Or you don't really get to change it very much. But, you know, you go to a radically different distribution of matter, say, you know, a huge mass, much bigger than the sun, you get a much stronger curvature field. The curvature of space-time around the Earth is pretty slight compared to the curvature around the sun. So the, the new thing about general relativity is putting space-time and matter into a kind of interactive relationship that they never had before. It's not getting rid of the idea of absolute rotation or showing that inertia is always caused by distant masses. The way Weil puts it is, these theories are, he, he kind of borrows a phrase from Minkowski. Remember, Minkowski says um, something very much like, it's kind of a misleading to call this the theory of relativity, namely special relativity, right? He says we really should call it the postulate of the absolute world because now we know that the world is this four-dimensional space-time structure. Now, Weil says, Weil takes up this idea, and says, well, this is, these are all Newtonian space-time, special relativity, and general relativity are all theories of world structure. The wor world structure means the structure of the world in space and time. So, just from the experiences that were available to Newton and to the average person, we know that there is an inertial structure because we feel the difference between accelerating and not accelerating. Unless it's that unique state of acceleration that's acceleration due to gravity, right? But we know that if you're rotating, you feel the effects of rotation because there are centrifugal forces. And all these are evidences of the existence of world structure. 
the fact that the speed of light is the same in every direction. That's a, an expression of the world structure, of space-time structure. The fact that there are special inertial trajectories. That's an expression of world structure. <clears throat> so you might, from Weil, what Weil was trying to suggest is, the way to, the way to think about the, the change, the philosophical changes that are taking place in space-time theory, first to start, first to remember that they're all theories of world structure. Once Newton recognized that inertial structure is fundamental, right, that's a, that sort of created the template for space-time theory, that it's a theory of inertial structure. And Weil makes this remark, well, if you didn't have a theory of world structure of some kind, even the notion of absolute motion, or, sorry, even the notion of relative motion doesn't make any more sense than the notion of absolute motion. Because there's no such thing as, this is what I was talking about earlier, right? there's no such thing as the objective relative motions of bodies unless you have a theory of space-time structure. So the question is, how are you supposed to regard the radical changes that took place with Einstein? Well, first you realize that locally, the causal structure isn't Newtonian absolute time, but it's the Sinkowski light cone structure. <coughs> <clears throat> the next change you notice is, well, the global structure of space-time isn't just a kind of larger picture of Minkowski space-time that you see locally. It's actually variable because it's determined by the distribution of mass. So you can actually put... Um, you can actually explain the relations between these theories well actually I don't, I don't really have time to do this because I have to uh, next week we'll start talking about quantum mechanics I'll just say this one more thing about time about the relation between Newtonian theory and special relativity and general relativity I'd like to get this on. So, if you have any questions about that, as usual, if you started working on the next plan, you know, send me a draft, etc. Thank you. 